Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Congressman Roscoe Parker. Thank you very much. Wow, I uh, hardly know what to say. Thank you all very, very much. I'm pleased that we could have had a small part in making this possible. I've been to the floor of the House now, I think, 52 times to talk about uh, uh, energy. When I first went there, I knew of only one speech about uh, mid-1900s that I thought then and still think is probably the most important speech given uh, during the last century, and that was a speech given, I think, the 8th day of March in 1956 in San Antonio, Texas, by an oil geologist by the name of M. King Hubbard, and he made a prediction which was believed to be absolutely ridiculous. He said that in just 14 years from that time, the United States would reach its maximum oil production, and after that, it would just be downhill in the production of oil. At that time, we were the Saudi Arabia of oil in the world. We were the largest producer of oil, the largest consumer of oil, the largest exporter of oil in the world, and right on schedule. In 1970, the United States reached its maximum oil production. Today, today in spite of drilling more oil wells than all the rest of the world put together, we produce about half the oil that we did in 1970. When I saw those statistics, I uh, rec oh, by the way, he uh, predicted that the world would be reaching its maximum oil production about the turn of the century. That was delayed a bit because of technologies that you couldn't have envisioned in those days where we could get to more oil than they, they could then. Recognizing this, I began a campaign more than a decade ago of going to the floor and warning that uh, fossil fuels were finite. One day they would run out. We needed to be uh, prepared for that. I was about halfway through this, probably, before uh, we uh, learned of a, a speech, but, which I think was the most insightful speech of the last century. I don't even know if these two men knew each other. But the person giving the second speech, it was the 14th day of May, 1957, about a year later. And it was given in, in St. Paul, Minnesota. The audience was irrelevant. It was a group of physicians. The speech was given by the father of our nuclear submarine, M. King Hubbard. I'm sorry, uh, 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 Hyman Rickover. Um, you need to pull up that speech. You can find it. It was lost for a number of years now. It's on the internet. I think there's a link on our website to it. But just Google for Rickover energy speech, and that speech will, uh, will come up. And he said a couple of things that ought to be pretty obvious. One was that uh, said in, um, that in the 8,000-year recorded history of man, he said the age of oil will be but a blip. He had no idea. I didn't know the world. We had 8,000 years recorded in history. That's his number. Um, he had no idea how long the age of oil would last. We now pretty much know how long the age of oil would last. It's going to last about 300 years. We're about 150 years into the age of oil. We have about another 150 years of, of oil left in the world. Um, we're not running out of oil. There's more oil to be pumped than all the oil that we have pumped in all of the history of the world. What we have run out of is our ability to pump oil as fast as we would like to use it. We would like our economy to grow, so with Europe, and now we have some rapidly growing economies in India and China and the developing world. And it's kind of the perfect storm at just the time that they would like more energy. Um, there is a cap on the amount of energy that is available. For five years now, the world has been stuck at 84 million barrels of oil a day. That hasn't moved. That's why when our economy is uh, not good, European economy is not good. Uh, the economy in China has slipped from about, what, 14, 16% growth to 8% growth. Oil is still about $100 a barrel. West Texas Intermediate, a bit less, but the oil most traded in the world is Brent. It's $20, $25 more than West Texas Intermediate. And that oil has been at more than $100 a barrel for quite a while now. There are three groups today, very diverse groups, that are applauding what you've done here. They really need to stop uh, attacking each other's premise and join arms because they have three very different problems, but exactly the same solution to those problems. But one of those groups is the group that is concerned about the increase in the production of CO2 and uh, global warming, the acidification of the ocean. And of course, their solution to that problem is to move away from fossil fuels to renewables, because with renewables, you are not releasing CO2 that has been bound over millions of years, millions of years. 
years ago in our fossil fuels. And so the CO2 will not go up if you're using renewable because you're releasing CO2 that's been sequestered just a bit ago. Um, a second group which will apply what you're doing today with a very different agenda but exactly the same solution to the problem. It's a group that is really concerned that since the United States has about 2% or so of the reserves of oil in the world we use, almost a fourth of all the oil in the world and we're now still importing more than half the oil we use, it was up to about two-thirds, and they see this as a huge national security risk. And of course, the solution to that problem is move away from fossil fuels to renewables, which is exactly what you are, what you're doing here. And the third group that is applauding you is the group, and the one I've been talking about, those that recognize that oil is finite. It will be gone. We need to, to transition to other sources of energy. About a little less now than five years ago, I led a CODEL. Nine of us went to China to talk about energy. I was stunned. The Chinese began their discussion of energy by talking about post-oil. Of course we will live in a post-oil world. The moon isn't made out of green cheese and blue cheese and the uh, uh, earth isn't oil. So one day it will run out. The only question is, is, is when? Uh, this is not going to be for a while, as we probably have oil, it'll ever be uh, harder and harder to get, less and less of it available, higher and higher in cost. But we'll have oil for about another 150 years. The Chinese are already talking about a, uh, uh, a post-oil economy. Well, they had a five-point five plan. It ought to be everybody's five-point plan. The first uh, part of this plan was uh, conservation. Wow, that's the cheapest energy you'll ever use is the energy you don't use, and we can do a lot of conservation. We in this country use about twice as much energy per person as in Europe, and it's hard to argue that they don't live as well as happily in Europe as, as we do. There's the second and third was alternative energy and as much as, of that as you can from your own country. And the fourth one may surprise you, be kind to the environment. They recognize they're, they're not being kind to the environment. They have 900 million people in rural areas that do the miracle of communications, know the benefit of an industrialized world, and they're saying, hey guys, what about us? And the Chinese are struggling to meet the demands of those people. They're building a coal-fired power plant about every week and choking on the smoke, but if they can't meet the needs of these people, they see the, uh, uh, their empire unraveling, perhaps like the Soviet empire unraveling. And the fifth, the fifth point is a very interesting one, international cooperation. There is no way that the uh, world can avoid uh, uh, major problems without international cooperation. But we just say that reminded me of the fact that your government has paid for four studies. They ignored all four studies because the message was not one they wanted to hear. The first of those studies, which the only one I'll mention, there were three others by the Corps of Engineers and and the uh, uh, Government Accountability Office and the uh, uh, National uh, Petroleum Council. But the first one was a big SAIC report. Dr. Robert Hirsch was the uh, principal investigator on that. And they, one of the first statements they made was that the world has never faced a problem like this. That is a cap of the amount of available high quality uh, uh, energy. And the, uh, the fifth part of their plan was international cooperation. While they plead for international cooperation, they plan as if there won't be any because unlike us who are buying oil nowhere else in the world except at public auctions, the Chinese are buying oil reserves all over the world. Well, what you're doing here, everybody needs to be doing, you know, the lights may go out, this is a big storm, the ground's gonna be saturated, the winds will blow, trees will topple over, it wouldn't topple over in the usual storm, and your lights are still gonna be on. Just a bit ago, I've been at several big dedications now of huge solar arrays, and every one of them I've gone to are tied to the grid. And when the grid goes down, they're helpless. The grid doesn't want you pumping electricity into the grid, electrocuting the repair when they're trying to repair the grids. So all these systems are designed so that when the grid goes down, you're down. And they're going to sit there looking at those huge multi-million dollar solar arrays, and they won't even have one little light bulb they can light from it. What they need to do is to notice what you've done here sustainable, when the lights go out, you're still on, all of these others need to, to, to include some capabilities to do that. Again, I really pleased you're doing this. Wow, it puts, put Western Maryland on the map. Uh, you're way ahead of the rest of the universities and, and most of the country. By the way, just one final, one final uh, 
node. We now have uh, found the ability to get uh, gas out of Marcella Shale and, there, and, and out of the pocket oil out of the West. And a lot of people are now saying, gee, the energy crisis is over. We're going to be the Saudi Arabia of, uh, of uh, energy in the future. One of the figures I've heard for the oil equivalent in the gas that we're going to get from our cellular shale is 3.4 billion barrels of oil. And that sounds like a lot of oil, doesn't it? 3.4 billion barrels of oil. But you need to, to note that in just a little less than 12 days, the world uses 8 billion barrels of oil. 84 million barrels a day, about six great arithmetic, isn't it? And in between 11 and 12 days, the world uses 8 billion barrels of oil. What that means is that if the world's energy was going to come from our cellular shale, it would last the world around 40 days. Now, under the Marcellus shale, there's a big uh, Utica shale that has a lot of, of uh, oil in it. That's about 4.3 billion barrels of oil. Something like 50 days that will last the world. Newt Gingrich was talking the other day about a huge discovery of oil in Ohio. I think it was, what, five billion barrels of oil. That's not like a, that is a big discovery of oil. That will last the world about 60 days. Helen Greenspan would describe our reaction to our the discovery of our ability for horizontal drilling and fracking to release oil and, and gases from these tight shales as irrational exuberance. We will not be the Saudi Arabia of energy in the future. We will not be an oil exporting a country in a decade. You are really, really in, in the forefront here. Thank you very much for what you're doing. Congratulations. Everybody had a part in this. Thank you.